Okay, good evening, everyone. Today's Monday, October 2nd. I call this study session to order at 5.30. Mr. Secretary. Uh, Trustee Fawaz? Here. Trustee Saba? Here. Trustee Williamson? Here. Trustee Amons here. Trustee Berry? Here. Uh, Mr. Vice President? Here. And Ms. Elzea, it's out today. Ms. Elzea uh, sends her wishes. She's uh, on a personal trip. Dr. Masal. Thank you, uh, Chair. Sorry, sorry, Chair Vedun, um, and board. So we have two items on the study session this evening. The first item is the MASB uh, delegate assembly. Delegate assembly will begin Thursday, November 9th at 7 p.m. at the Lansing Center in Lansing. Delegates selected by boards of education across the state will decide MASB's positions on a wide variety of issues affecting education. All delegates must be school board members. Only delegates and alternatives named by our board may offer motions and vote on issues. However, all school board members may speak on the issues and participate in the debate. This does not require a formal action. So this evening, uh, the request is to identify, and Kristen, you can correct me, um, a delegate from our board who would represent us at MASB. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so at this time I can open it up to the board yep. for anyone, any suggestions? Anyone available November 9th at 7 p.m. in Lansing? That's a Thursday. So I know Billy, you probably can't read. I'll be in Lansing the week before, so I'm not going to stay another week. Thank you. It's just one day. It's just one day, Dr. Masala? It's just one day, yes. It's one day. I'm traveling that week, so I won't be able to make it. Four. I know we might have a night practice as well that Thursday, so. Yeah, if, it's, if we have to send somebody, I can tell. So, Trustee Williamson. Okay, thank you. And then, uh, Trustee Williamson, just, Kristen will get you all the information and everything you need. Okay. And please know that mileage is reimbursable. Okay. So you submit your mileage as well and any expenses. Thank you, thank you Trustee Williamson, thank for you, representing. Dear. Thank you. The next item is the 2023 data presentation and focus. Crestwood School District literacy and numeracy coaches will discuss, as you can see them all in the audience, I'll get to them in a moment, through the school improvement process, the initiatives that will be set in place and supported to increase student achievement. These initiatives will focus around the coach model, focus around reading, writing, and math, and will impact all subject areas. The instructional coach model was started in 22-23 school year at the Crestwood School District to support teachers to enhance their teaching strategies and methodologies. Additionally, starting in 22-23 school year, there was a more focused emphasis on literacy and numeracy to assist all students as the data prior to 2019 and the data coming out of COVID-19 illustrated that these were areas of need and focus. So I will start the presentation, um, Mr. Chair, I'm gonna go up to the front, sure. and then I'm gonna invite each school over uh, when it's their turn to present. So I am basically going to um, reiterate, and I'm, I think I'm gonna to have to do this. I'm going to basically reiterate um, the data that was sent to the board a couple months, I bet a few weeks back. Um, and I'm gonna go through some of these slides and discuss some things. And then I'm gonna turn it over to the coaches and they're gonna talk about our interventions and our steps moving forward. So one thing, the first slide represents our social demographic data since 2016. Now when you look at the data from 2016, the blue line shows that there's been a steady increase of economically distressed students. These are families who are living at or below the poverty level. They are, they are um, eligible for free and reduced lunch. If you, the data, if you go back even further, prior to 2010, that number is below 50%. So there's been a steady increase with our students of need. Additionally, what you see in red here is our English language learners. Now, one of the, so it's a good thing, and I mentioned this in the presentation that I sent to the board, we have exited many English language learners from our district the last couple of years through our assessments and through our RETA process as well as our instruction. So that's a good thing. So the EL numbers are going down. But what ends up happening is when you exit EL students out of the EL subgroup and, you, and they're solely being represented in the general population, you have more high risk EL students remaining. So there's a larger concentration of EL students. 
So our EL numbers, you could see they jumped up in 2018, and there's been a steady decrease since 2020. And again, this is because these are students that are testing out of the EL program, so that's a very positive thing. If you can see here, our special education numbers have also gone down. In, in, eight, in 2020, we had 8.71% of our students for special education. In 2023, this, up to this year, we're at 7.06%. Again, this is due to more rigorous use of multiple tiers of student supports, our focus on exiting students on special education, but all, not exiting, I apologize, ensuring that the right students are entering special education. You know, so with our increase in our coaches, uh, social workers, school psychiatrists, psychologists, our special ed team, they're able to work with the students and assess every individual student to ensure that they're receiving the correct um, resources. So Dr. Masala, before you move on, just to clarify the data here, I'm assuming that these numbers are, um, the baseline is 100% of our students? Correct. Right? And the red line shows English as a second language? Correct. Okay. And the yellow line is the special <coughs> education enrollees. Does this also include um, students that get bused to a different district for special education? Correct. So that's all inclusive? It's all inclusive. Okay. Because they're still our students of record. Okay. Thank yeah, you. I have a question. So when I look at the 23.18%, uh, uh, you're saying that. Uh, the proficiency rate in that group is 23 out of the 100? That's not proficiency. This is our number of students that represent those demographics. So the 23%. So throughout, 23 through the whole district. So 23% in 2016 had English as a second language. Okay. okay. So I'm going to talk briefly about iReady and go over a couple things with iReady, but I want to talk about what iReady is compared to what MSTEP and PSAT is. I-Ready is a growth measurement. It assesses the students where they're at when they come in, it assesses them as we move forward, and assesses them in the spring. It's aligned with the Common Core. This was adopted by our district, I believe, in 2020, and we have been using, this was, this last year's data was the first full year of data that we could look at where coming out of COVID-19, they had a full year of school. So it was very indicative of the amount of growth that we've made as a school district. Where MSTEP and PSAT, MSTEP, PSAT focuses solely on proficiency. So you could have a student, and I'm gonna get into that when, I, when we show the iReady quadrant data. You can have students who come in and they're low proficient, but high growth. And that's what the iReady helps us with. Where MSTEP, it just tells us where they're at on the proficiency scale. And it's very difficult to see how much growth they truly had with the actual curriculum. Um, what you will see is what I highlighted here is the vast majority of our students are high growth, low performance, but when you see the quadrant data, I'll be able to explain that, where these students, there are so many that are right on the line of high growth, high performance. Like, we're making major growth in all of our areas. Uh, Dave, can you click on that iReady quadrant link for me, please? No problem. It's, <laughs> it's hidden, so you're good. Russell, 2023. <laughs> <laughs> and I just may bother you, David, to scroll down for me as well. All right, so let's start with Kenlock Elementary. Let's look at their math. This is very important because on the upper right-hand corner, that's, where we, that's the goal. Every student's got high performance, high growth. That's the goal. But the reality of it is, Many of our students are very far behind, therefore their proficiency levels are low, and a lot of this is coming out of COVID, especially what you see in the math scores, but you're seeing high growth, which means that we're catching them up faster, and we're actually beating the national averages, and I'll get to that in a moment. So what you see here, if you look at the quadrant, the upper right-hand quadrant is high performance, high growth. The upper left-hand quadrant is low performance, high growth, which means that when you look at kindergarten, second and first, kindergarten is like right on the margin. First and, first and second grade are right, they're inside that quadrant. Third grade, 
you got it, they're close, they're inching over to the right. So what you want to see in this is you want them to see them itching over to the right of that. If they're, in, if they're all the way on the left-hand side of that quadrant, okay, we're, we're not growing fast enough. But these are students that are inching over. If you scroll down, that's math, if you scroll down to reading, and this is all in your packet that you received prior, you look at reading. Now, you have much higher proficiency and much higher growth in reading. Now, as you all are aware, last year we piloted a brand new elementary math program because even prior to COVID, one of the things that we identified in the conversations with the curriculum council and the coaches and the teachers was we needed one solidified math program in our elementaries. We did not have that. All of our teachers were doing great things, but one person may be doing it this way, another person may be doing it that way, and we needed to create cohesiveness. What you will see is that cohesiveness, actually, when we get into the middle school math scores, you'll see a big jump in math in fifth grade from the previous year because of this support in the math program. If you scroll down, uh, David, to Hillcrest math, again, fourth grade, so th those, current, those fourth graders are currently fifth graders, and as the board is aware, we changed our middle school philosophy where the fifth grade students now travel as a cohort, so they're not being mixed up with other elementary students when they come to fifth grade at Riverside. So all of these students are followed, all of these students' data is following them, and the teachers have that data readily available to make interventions. And, and, and to reiterate, now if you look at it, you look at kinder, I mean, they're, they're blowing it off the charts. First and second grade is almost there. Third grade is a little bit behind, but fourth grade is the furthest behind. Where we look at this, what we say here is, because of the change in the math programming, K-1-2 is able to make faster growth because they don't have the COVID lag. Grades three and four have the COVID lag. The students in the middle school have the COVID lag. And when you add into that COVID lag, you're also adding into that there wasn't a consistent math program in the elementary schools. Now there is. <laughs> so we're making strides and we're moving in the right direction. So we'll click out of this. I know the board has all this. Uh, question. Yes. Um, what are we doing as far as, so when they're like in those math sections, the students that maybe um, are slower than others or at a different level than the others, are they still within like the same class where you know, somebody that gets it, it might be boring for them, right? So now they're not doing mm -hmm. as well because they know it, or the complete opposite where, you know, someone's struggling. My are answer? we like putting them, are we trying to put the ones that are struggling more so in the same class so it goes at a different pace or? Yes and no, and when the coaches come up, they're gonna go over exactly what their plan is. Okay. They can go into more detail than I. So I'm gonna save that for them. So you guys remember that. So okay. one more thing, Dr. Masala. Yes. If, if you look at that growth, and obviously every school will be stronger or more areas of opportunity than other schools, right? It ranges, and that's obvious, right? So do we, do we have like subgroups for like, to share best practices and workshops? Like all the kindergarten teachers from all three schools get together for a couple hours. You buy them lunch, of course, <laughs> and they talk about, hey, we're doing this, it works with really well, or we tried this and it didn't work well, mm -hmm. just to spread that best practices across the district? So one of the things, and the coaches will get into that as well, uh, first off, with our built-in professional development days, that's part of the, where with the students have the day off, that's part of it. Each school also has their own operating budget where they can budget in subs like roving substitutes where teams can get together for a couple hours, talk about things, and then the substitutes go to another group. So we are trying to implement that as much nice. as possible. And the nice thing with the coaches, and the coaches will talk more about it, is that they're the go-to person where like, hey, uh, you know, they might come to me if I'm the principal and say, you know, I want to get uh, Haas and Selwa together to talk about this neck and we work that out and then the, the administration supports them on nice. that. So what we're doing and what you're going to see is we're moving, we're moving away from a, a top-down approach. The idea is, look, from the top we're saying this is what the data is. Now we're coming to the people that are in the trenches and saying, okay, how do we improve this? What can we do? What do you need from us? And this was what we started last year and it's like in full implementation this year. And the coaching model here at the Crestwood School District is a new model. And we are partnered with Dearborn Schools where our coaches have like a partner coach over at the Dearborn Schools that they can talk to because in the Dearborn Schools they've been doing the coaching model for over a decade and a half, if not longer. So no, no reason to reinvent the wheel. I don't know.
I threw you off. <laughs> there we go. Okay. It's coming. There it is. I'm going to go backwards because I, I clicked it a few times, so it jumped. All right. So M step PSAT, SAT. Like I said earlier, <coughs> iReady is on growth, but it's growth on the common core. That's why we went with iReady. I just like the board to know that myself, as well as members of Wayne County RESA, we've been pushing really hard for the state to start looking at benchmark assessments such as the iReady in addition to MSTEP and PSAT. Because our argument is these benchmark assessments allow us to assess students three times a year, which truly identifies growth. One of the things that you have to understand about that quadrant data is if we have a child grow one year, we've done our job. Our goal is to push every child to grow a year and a half. I mean, that, and that's a push. That's where you're gonna hear them talk about stretch growth and so on and so forth. But you'll see in the slides, over 100% of our students are growing one year. Now, and we're beating the national norms on some other areas, and you'll see that as well. So MSTEP, ELA, real quick. So tw the first three set of bar graphs is 2022. The next three set of bar graphs is 2023. And ELA, you can see in every area, third through fourth and fifth grade, we had improvement and increase, and we've beat in the ISD averages, as well as beating the state averages in two areas and being very close in a third area. I give this credit 100,000%. All this credit goes to our teachers because of what you talked about, uh, Trustee Badoon. They got together. They looked at the data. They identified what can we do better. How can we improve? So this is a true testament to them. Math. So if you look at the math data, one of the things here that illustrates that this new math curriculum is going to help because of the pilot programming, in 2022, our fifth grade was only 13.9% proficient in math, okay? This was the first year of MSTEP out of COVID. You can see we jumped to 25.1%. We had one of the largest jumps in the county. We're, we beat the county <coughs> in all areas. Um, what we're short uh, from the state. So it shows that we're making improvement. We've made improvement from year over year in ELA and math in grades three through five. Now remember, I want to go back to grades four and five, four and up all have the COVID lag. And that COVID lag means that they are behind when it comes to performance. But that's why we're paying very close attention to growth. And you know, you look at the state numbers, you can see with the state numbers, this is not just a Crestwood issue. You know, this is something across the state, across the nation. When you look at ELA, ELA, fifth grade, we had a little drop, but we improved in other areas. We had a little drop in third, but we're still even, we're very close. Dr. Masala, this is yes. sixth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. This is, oh, my apologies, thank you. This is ELA 6-7, not 8. Yeah, ELA 6-7, PSAT 8. Thank you, Trustee Bidu. So what you see here is even with the COVID lag, we're still beating the ISD, and we're beating the state in a, one area, and we're really close in two other areas, and we're showing growth. So when we look at this, we're looking at how are we compared to the rest of the ISD? How are we compared to the rest of the state? Because that shall, shall, gives you a big picture. Himself. Trustee uh, Barry has a question. So since we see that there is that little bit of a drop, what are we doing to support the staff um, and a system in bringing these kids to where they need to be? And I'll, I'll leave that to the coaches because that's what they're going to talk about. Okay. So in 20, and then you look at the math. Math, <coughs> our most struggling grade this year, and trust me, there's a coach right now who's nodding her head, and we, we talked. You know, our most struggling grade this year was grade six. And if you know, if you go back and you look at the fifth grade before, they struggle. So we know that sixth grade is an area that needs high intensive support. And the team's gonna talk about what they're doing for that. Um, and then in grade seven and eight, we had growth. We are actually beating the ISD and we are close to the state. So we know sixth grade math is a concern. And the coaches will talk about what they're doing for sixth grade math. Says, one thing I want to add to the board is last year was the first real set of data this team actually had to work off of. Because the year before, 
That was COVID data and not everyone took the test. It was voluntary. The year before that, there was no test. And you can't go back the year before COVID because that's a completely different subset of students because it doesn't truly illustrate scientific evaluation. So we're really focused on this year's data. We focused on last year's, but this year's data is, is our strongest source of data because last year, in our opinion, was the first real full year of school. And we know, we talked a lot at this board level about social emotional learning, getting our students acclimated to go back to school, getting kids to show up to school. Those are some different things. Science. Now, I'm, I'm, I, I, me personally, I was very pleased with Science Force because the science curriculum is like all over the place. And we have our science teachers working together, but our focus right now is how do we support literacy and numeracy in science? Because our focus as a district is this. When a student takes the PSAT, SAT, or MSTEP, it's not only a content area test, it's a reading test. And if the students are struggling with literacy, they're gonna struggle on the test. There's a lot of times, and I'm telling you, I, these coaches and these teachers could tell you stories about kids who they pull aside, and they're like, hey, why didn't you do it on that test? You know, you know the curriculum, you know, and it's, it's the reading piece. So that's why you always hear that focus on literacy and numeracy. So science, we did some pretty good things, and I think now with our STEAM focus at the middle school and all our robotics programming, that's also gonna help us with science, because that's literacy and numeracy. When you look at social studies, you can see social studies, we had growth, but not enough. But you look at the state and you look at the ISD, there's a problem with social studies. And I'll tell you what the problem is, and we all know, the curriculum. So we gotta focus on to ensure that we are focusing on the common core, the curriculum of the social studies standards, but as well as increasing rigor. And what I mean by that is not repetition of facts, but the analysis and synthesis of facts. Like, why did it happen? How did it happen? What, what would it look like if it happened today? That's where we have to move. And our coaches and everyone's working on that. Yes? Is there specifically a reason why it just has five and eight, or um, we go to the other ones after? Five that? and eight are the only two uh, grade levels that uh, assess social studies. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a weird system of testing. I, that's another story for another day. PSAT 9, math and reading. So we, um, when you look at comparison to the state, PSAT 9, we're beating the state in reading. We're below in math, but that doesn't surprise us. As I was talking about COVID lag, not a systemic, systematic math uh, curriculum, now we're there. Now we're gonna build off of that. When you look at um, PSAT 10, well, you see some, we're actually above the state in uh, ELA, and, the, and math, this is weird. I'm gonna be honest with you, when I saw this data, I was surprised. We're beating the state in math, which is great, but we're below the state in reading, which was sort of shocking to me because we've been opposite all the way through. So when we look at this, I know our <coughs> high school coaches are looking at, okay, what is it on the PSAT that we might be missing? Like, what is it in the curriculum that we might have to emphasize a little bit more on? That's what this data is great for. Could it be the comprehension? It instead could be. Of the actual reading? Because they have to read the question to get the math question right. Correct, right. correct. And I, the coaches will speak more on that. They're, they're the experts in that area, I, I can tell you that. Um, the other thing with PSAT is, and I hate to say it this way, with PSAT, it's getting all the students to take the test seriously. Because there's a lot of students who take the test very seriously because they want to do really well in the SAT, and there's some students who are like, ah, this doesn't matter. So it's something that we struggle with as well. SAT composite. So if you look at, uh, we grew on the SAT in both math and reading, but, and we are just short of the state in reading, and we are just short of the state in math. So we're, we're com comparable when it comes to those areas. So we're moving in the right direction. And, you know, and here with the SAT, you get more students who take it seriously because we tell them, hey, you're getting it for free this time. If you don't like your score, then you can pay and do it again. Um, but I can tell you our high school team has been working very closely. The other thing that I don't have up here is we, I shared with every school and every team the breakdown of every one of their students. So they can identify which students are really close to passing, which students are just making it. Because one thing that you don't see in this data is the partially proficient. The partially proficient are those kids, like you were mentioning, that need that little bit extra push, that little bit extra time. All our coaches have that data. 
Teachers are getting that data. We're actually using that data. And that's something that's going to make a difference over time. So that's just a, I'm, I would say quick, I know it wasn't that quick, but it's a breakdown of the data that I had shared with the board a few weeks back with that presentation. And now what I want to do is I want to turn it over to the coaches to talk about the questions that you asked. I mean, please feel free to ask some questions. And coaches, if there's anything you want to add, you are more than welcome to add. So I'm going to call up the Highview Hawks first. <laughs> so you, may, you might want to stand over here just so you can see the screen. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, I'm Julie Snook. I am the new Mercy coach at Highview as well as Kinlock. And Michelle could not be here this evening. She's our literacy coach. Um, but this is us. So looking at our eye ready reading, uh, the percentage of students who met a year's worth of growth. So we look from spring 2022 to uh, spring 2023. And this is a little bit different than what Dr. Masalam shared, but we were looking to see how much growth we would have. Um, so we had 50, I'm trying to see over there, 58% of our students at the end of the 2022 year had made growth from the beginning of the year. Um, and in 2023, we went up to 69% um, in the area. And according to the norms, it's a 52% growth in reading is the norm. So we went above both years for reading. Any questions on this slide? Now with iReady Math, the percentage of students, again, who met a year's worth of growth, you'll notice um, we had 54% of our students uh, at the end of the spring 2022 year um, meet their typical growth and then um, this last spring 2023, it was 61%. So we are growing. We did implement the new math. Um, we were focused a lot on the students using their pathways on a regular basis. If you're not familiar with that, they each take an assessment that gives us this data, and then they get what's called a pathway, and it's aligned specifically for their needs. And so they're provided uh, a number of minutes per week that they're supposed to work on or go above that. So those also help to improve their scores in the long run. Um, and we also get the data to help with the um, small groups and those kind of things. Um, I, I don't mean to interrupt. I'm so sorry, yes. Do, do you remember, I uh, was, because I don't see it, do you remember what your progress towards your typical growth was? I know it was over 100%. Uh, yeah, you know what, we don't have that one up there, but yes, I believe it was something near 110% progress towards the typical growth. So we went up and way up and above um, within that year span of time. Um, in response to data, these are some of the things that we wanted to list on here, but there are a few others I can talk about. Um, but specifically in numeracy, I'll start with since I'm the numeracy coach, um, we are having explicit tier one teaching now with our new math curriculum. Um, and K-5 is in the classroom mathematics. We have provided hands-on math tools that go along with the program, and um, the teachers have those available, and many of them are already pulling them out to work in small groups. We are doing a lot of fluency support. iReady has a program called Fluency Flight that is specific for two to fifth grade, um, and I am just have a second to fourth because that's what we cover. And Fluency Flight, we've noticed that fluency has been a struggle across the board. Kids are not as automatic as we were when we grew up. And it's, in the long run, it's taking them longer to then process and do the other math that they need to do. <coughs> so with that being said, um, I already did that, plus I myself am going into at least grades right now two through four and giving three times a year in addition, subtraction, um, multiplication, if they're in third grade. And then in January, a division. Um, and it's based on the benchmarks from the Common Core. So what kids should have already known. Um, I'm gathering a lot of information for that. Uh, Jen Kibbe is our interventionalist. She will be looking at the kids that have fallen kind of there. And then we are starting our after school math program to focus primarily on fluency. And it'll be game based. Um, and the kids that are like on that cusp of just needing some support. Uh, we're going to be utilizing that this year as our new uh, math form. Ms. Snook, 
Yes. Can you describe, so the after school, is that, is that a, a teacher there? Is that an NHS student? Or do they actually like read the homework with them to explain it's it? Or not, how does it work? It's actually not going to be like a homework based. It's going to be more through games, um, partnering up. They'll be, um, just to get them going with their addition, subtraction, multiplication facts, so they're more fluent with that is what we're going to start off with. There will be some lessons, but it won't be that traditional like you're in the class, classroom area all the time with the teacher standing up, but there will be teachers there. So the teachers will be doing the work, we'll split them up in groups is the plan, and they will be multi-grade level also. So if we even have third and fourth grade students who are still struggling with addition, I need to get those kiddos in there and push them forward so that they can move along with that. But it's gonna be more of an actual game based so they can actually take things home with them and do things like that. That's and the that's plan. And that's every day or? Um, we haven't established all of that yet. It's probably okay. gonna be two days a week. Okay. Yeah, and we hope to start by the end of October for that. Um, they do have their pathways, which I talked about, which are individual lessons. We have a lot of teamwork in all the, in all the buildings now, but that includes your classroom teacher, your interventionist, the numeracy coach, the special ed, everybody. Linda, we get together and have dialogues. Um, about what we're noticing with our students and needs. Um, and I'm also going to PLCs to meet with the teachers, um, find out if they need any support. Small group, um, we're gonna be using that in the classrooms based on data. The data will come from like the fluency as well as iReady at this point in time, as well as anything that teachers might see going on in class. Um, some of that will be interventionalists with Kibby pushing in. Mrs. Kibby, I should say. Sorry, I always call her Kibby. And um, I will be pushing into some of those classrooms also for those bubble kids that might need extra support based on the present <coughs> curriculum. So we're all trying to get all of that push in there. And if you'll notice, it says the workshop model. The workshop model is a way where the teacher presents the lesson. Students can work independently, but the teacher has a chance to pull kids over to work with them then in the classroom while other kids are working on material that they should already be familiar with, but it constantly revisits that curriculum with them. So, and then uh, we're doing a family math night for that. And then we've got writing uh, going on with um, Michelle, and she's pushing in this year, uh, very focused on our new writing binders. Um, she attends the weekly PLCs. She's doing a lot of small group support um, with literacy footprints. LLI, and now we have Magnetic through iReady. Um, vocabulary is a big focus, and it is actually in both areas, um, in math also, and um, she's doing explicit teaching with that. We also have at Highview, um, our focus is on M-STEP third and fourth with doing, um, I've pushed into classrooms and worked with teachers on how to approach some of the questions in the domains that we're scoring lower in. Um, to help their students understand the questions, because as Mr. Baydun was saying, sometimes they can't comprehend what they're reading or they miss part of the question. And so we spend time with them going in and really focusing on what they're reading in there. Yes. What would you say the frequency is of you or the interventionist going into the actual classroom and viewing? Mrs. Kibbe um, has a schedule and it's based on the data and the needs of the students, so it depends on that. Her schedule is fuller than mine. Mine is based on teacher as well as student needs. Since I am split between two buildings, um, I have to kind of split my time between both of those times. So on average, I'm either a morning or an afternoon at one of the two schools, and it's by voluntary choice at first, and then there's other teachers that might sign up for a day and say, will you help give small group assessments, will you do things like that. So. Was kind of the way so it with is. all that, what, what what would it look like? So, I think, if you don't mind, sure, go right ahead. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, okay. So, Miss Snook's schedule will look more like um, coaching and modeling instruction for teachers, so that they are able to strengthen their toolkit of um, instructional strategies when they are presenting. So that's part of her schedule. Um, the interventionist and the rest of Ms. Snook's schedule would be in classrooms working with small groups. Um, Ms. Kibbe being strictly the interventionist, that's every hour of every day where she's not on her lunch or planning period. She would be with students in a small group in the classrooms. Okay, yep. thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. 
<clears throat> so this is all going by uh, the classes that you choose are going decided by data, correct? Most often it's the data, but there are some teachers that may reach out and want something here or there for my support, either to help them with a lesson or, like I said, a small group assessment. Um, some students, they need that small group piece and they're not considered special ed or anything yet, So, but it's nice <coughs> to give them that, even in the upper grades. Any other questions? Actually, one more question. Yeah. Do all schools do it like that, Linda? Like they all do it based on data? Yeah. Or, okay. I, I can add to that too. Last year was more voluntary because we were just starting the coaching model and our data wasn't as strong. This year that we have all this data, it's still voluntary, but based on the data, there are some classrooms where there is, okay, we need to bring more people in to support. So they'll, like, they'll select classrooms off of data and then if teachers want to sign up, they can sign Correct. up. Correct. Hi. Thank you, Ms. Thank Kibbe. You, Ms. Snook, sorry, I called you Ms. Kibbe because you said Kibbe, now I got hungry. Well, good evening, I'm Kristen Ramold. I am the literacy coach at Hillcrest Elementary. Very proud to be. So we'll start with our iReady reading data. This is from last year. As you can see on the top left, we had 64% of our students meet their typical growth. Also notable, we had 44% of our students reach stretch growth. So that's the growth that's gonna get them closer to grade level. And then even that 11% is in the 80 to 99%. So I expect to see that even higher this year. Um, the progress to annual typical growth, this is, it shows the median, we're at 143%, which surpasses what iReady is looking for. I believe it's 130, so that's excellent. And then if we look at the placement distribution, of course we want to be in the green, that means they're somewhere within their grade level. At the beginning of last year, we were at 12%, by the end we grew to 57% in the grade level. Hello, I'm Rhonda Abdallah. I'm the numeracy coach at Hillcrest. So for our math, um, same thing, we've seen a lot of growth. We're really proud. Uh, for our typical growth, we were at 65%, and our stretch goal growth, we were at 39%. Now, the difference between the two, typical growth is where I already feels they would typically go. We want to look at stretch growth. Stretch growth is where it's gonna get them at grade level, the closer to grade level. And as you, as you see, you know, our stretch growth is very high. Um, same thing, we were at our uh, progress annual typical growth was at 127%. And we grew in math from 5% in the green to 49% in the green by spring. That's from fall to spring. And we're, we're really super proud of our Huskies. So in response to this, what I'm really excited about noticing this year is that we're very laser focused on the data. We've already jumped in, we've already strategized for this school year. We um, have met as a staff, staff meetings, we've been in common planning. We also had our first ELA committee meeting where we, we looked closely at all the data made some strategic decisions and communicated that with teachers. So that, I think, is really going to make the difference um, this year. And then I have some specific things that we've also done using the curriculum with Fidelity. We have teachers who are in statewide training above and beyond what they're receiving here um, to teach reading more effectively. We have supplies for our teachers. Um, every, every resource they need, we're, we're there to supply it for them. Last year, we focused on one strand of the <coughs> iReady, which was phonological awareness. We made significant growth in that, so now we can focus on vocabulary. And we are meeting with our teachers regularly to show them the research, give them the resources, and make sure they know what Hillcrest goal is and you know giving them what they need to to meet the goal All right. and adding on to what everything that miss snook said it's kind of basically the same thing with small groups and and um, as you can see but our main focus again is fluency um, when we met with dr masalam a few weeks ago he talked about the data and computation and meaning that a student should not still be doing this 
at a certain age, and that's what our um, laser focus is. So uh, the biggest thing that we have in our uh, at Hillcrest is our mathathon. It's really big. The kids absolutely love it, and basically, I'm providing weekly copies or digital. This year, we moved third and fourth grade and fifth grade moved to digital, and then the lower L is paper copies of just fluency, fluency, time test. And then I would come in and we would have the test and the top three get a certificate and they get their picture taken and they get on the bulletin board and then we have grade level, they'll take the test and they get, you know, CAB has been awesome and they would give gift cards and um, treats and everything and it's just a really, really big thing and the kids absolutely love it um, and we post their picture. And then the fluency routine, Clever is great that we are able to just download apps like Extra Math and then it automatically embeds all the kids' names and the rosters. Teachers don't have to keep track of all that anymore and pins and they just automatically go in there. Flight fluency, like Ms. Snook said, this is new this year for second to fifth grade. It's more um, engaging, you know, the kids love it. It's only very short, like eight to 10 minutes of fluency four days a week and then it just shuts off and then the kid wants to go on the next day because they want to see their avatar and they want to earn points and so we're really, uh, we love that. Um, same thing, we're, we're doing math family night. This year I'm going to try, we're going to do STEAM. So math is going to join STEAM so that there's something for everyone and I just want to make it bigger. And um, flip classroom, so I already has uh, you know, we can assign a lesson. So this year I'm kind of pushing in with teachers to front load. So if the kids are just gonna, let's say for example, they're gonna work on volume, then they w we would front load an assignment. Kids can watch it at their own time, go through the lessons and whether they get it correct or not, but they have like a little bit of background and they have a little foundation and a visual, especially for our ESL students. And then as the teacher is teaching it, this kid's like, oh, okay, I remember this, you know, and they can go back and work on that. So that's that's our new initiative this year. I think and that's it. Yes. So this would basically go across all grades, but um, so to the question before, do we, and I know we're just now starting to gather all of this data, but do we sit down um, and, and your teams, I guess, and differentiate or segregate the kids that need extra help and you know, maybe put them all in a class versus the kids that may not need the extra help. That way we can throw more resources like into that group or not in this one, you know, just so, so we're not having a combination of both where it hurts one or the other. So, and I, and I, I heard your question earlier and I, and I appreciate it. That's a great question. Um, basically, research shows that you want to have a little bit of a mix. You want that high student with the low student with the middle student, okay? And so some classrooms we have to have, like specifically, let's say ESL, our, our, our zero English, our ones and twos, they have to have a certain teacher, a certified teacher in a certain classroom. Um, same thing like with, let's say, special ed. But in general, research-based, you want that little bit of a mix. For to, math too? For all subjects. Okay. So to answer that, like I'll give you just an example. Right now I'm gonna start cycling with a teacher that is an ESL teacher, she's teaching math, and she has a lot of zero English, many, a few zero English, ones and twos, and then she has a mix of other classrooms. So for that example specifically, my role, I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna cycle with her for eight weeks to give her the support she needs because she has students that are zero English. Then we have the title interventionist, she'll be coming in also, but she'll be working probably the whole year. Okay. She's gonna do the bottom 30%. The teacher is going to do the ESL kids, let's say when we have our, after she teaches the lesson. And then I'm working with the bubble kids. So those kids that are just about that grade level and just maybe need that push. Those eight weeks should be enough for those kids. And okay. then I would cycle through with another classroom if that answers your question. I see. It's the same because any classroom, any subject, you're going to have a wide range of students. So you want to make sure that you're setting up your classroom. I just had this conversation this morning with our first grade teachers, setting up your classroom so they can work independently so you can meet with those groups. Because she had some learning letters and some, you know, reading beyond grade level. So you're always going to have that, that gap. So if you set it up with the workshop model, you're guaranteed to different, differentiate for all your students. It's a great question. 
Thank you. And I wanted to add the workshop model. <laughs> yeah, I, it's the hill crusher. Yeah, we, we as you can see, honestly, when it comes down to it, the passion is there. This passion that you hear, that's why we want, we want you to ask these questions. We want to answer these questions. The workshop model would be like, for example, let's say in math, the 60 minutes the teacher is going to teach whatever second grade lesson that is. Then there's going to be 30 minutes where we're going to do those small groups. And the teacher can have this group maybe doing some lesson on the technology, this group is doing a little math game, and then she, she or he can pull those kids and just fill those gaps for our tier two or tier three students, if that makes sense. So tier one would be the whole class, everyone. And then tier two, tier three would be our kids that are uh, behind or zero English or special ed or whatever it may be in that classroom. Okay. Can you ask a question? Mm -hmm. I know that we had purchased some reading kits, correct? Yes. Uh, what, what were those called? The LLI. LLI, yeah. Right. Are we using the, those? I know those oh, were yes. quite expensive. Yeah, and we're using them daily. Okay. Absolutely. And how, we we how ordered are we, using them? we ordered more. Did you? How are we using them? We're using them to back to um, the question over here to differentiate. They're they're leveled readers, so that the kids can have books for their reading groups, but also there's a black and white copies that can go home, so they're engaging with their families, but also practicing. And that's um, across reading at their the level. district that we're, okay. thank you. Question, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> so, the, so you're saying the ESL kids get coaches also? Oh, absolutely. Okay, so they, get, they, they, they don't just get just ELD support, right? And then also do uh, the, the kids who are lower, do they get seen more than once or they just get seen, like is it, is it do they get the support that they need more than, <coughs> I don't know how to explain. Um, so the lower so kids, we so call it like a double dip, support. but yeah. they would get like a, a group like twice a day, basically. Okay. So with their classroom teacher and then the interventionist, I see some groups for, okay. and then Rhonda yeah, and Mrs. So, Hussein as well. So they get mm -hmm. the extra help that they need is what I'm saying. Okay. Yes. So like for example, if the title, um, they, they don't have just double dip, we get like a, they get triple. <laughs> they get a three scoop ice cream. Um, the teacher, then you have your interventionist working with those kids, and then I also may work with those kids. In that. So there's, there's plenty of support um, just all around. And then our iReady, like you were asking about the LLI, but this year we have iReady. They just sent like manipulatives. I mean, can, that was purchased separately actually. Um, so those small groups that there's hands on and tactile things for students to work on. So one more thing if I can. I see that you know this is a new thing, and we're you know we're growing with it. So, what kind of support are you getting? Are you going to conferences? Is somebody coming in? Because I know this is new to all of us here in the district, besides working with Dearborn. So, what are we doing to support you? So, I'm part of the coaching network. So, I go quarterly to RISA, and it's um, coaches within you know Wayne County. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge resource. I'm also a part of a state training um, called Letters. So I'm getting a higher level um, training in the latest greatest on how to teach reading. And I'm sharing that with the staff as well. That's great. May I, Kristen? Yes. Yeah. Um, in addition to that, uh, Mr. Fabris has been working with, uh, very closely with the coaches. Uh, he and I have scheduled monthly meetings with them so that we're able to have discussions about what's going well, where they need additional support, how we can provide that support for them. They have the opportunity to then also share ideas so they're learning from each other as to what's working for our district, right? Because our district's needs are <coughs> gonna be different than any other neighboring district's needs. And so um, I feel that those monthly meetings um, with the coaches, uh, Mr. Fabris and myself, have also provided the opportunity to have some discussions. I know um, I wouldn't be surprised if Mr. Fabers has some articles uh, waiting around for everybody to read and go through and learn some new strategies as well. So that's something that we put in place this year that we've also been implementing to bulk up that support for the coaches. Grow, yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank, Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Abdullah, sometimes I do use my fingers to count, so <laughs> cut us some that's slack. Okay. We, we got to gotta enroll you in the math of Right? That's, that's how your brother taught us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Dina Kazmarczak, and I'm a proud Kinlock Koala for the past 21 years. Uh, we're here to present our data to you. Uh, this is our iReady data, and as you can see, in, this is comparing fall of 2020 to spring of 2023. In the fall of 2020, we had 28% proficiency, um, and we grew a whopping 47% 47 uh, 47% of students increase, so we ended with 75% proficiency of our um, students by the end of the year in the spring. With that, you can also see that in our red, we went from 15% of our students being two grade levels or below, two grade levels or more below um, to 4% by the end of the year. So we're, we're moving them in the right direction. I'm back. Um, <laughs> in our area of math, in fall of 2022, um, we had 14% of our students showing proficiency in math. Um, and again, at the end, we grew to 65% of our students achieving um, their uh, normed area or their year's growth. Um, we also started off with 14% of our students were in the red, which again is two to three grades below where they're at. Um, and we moved to only 3% of that. And again, as they stated earlier, this is our annual typical growth. So that growth is based upon a year's worth of growth. And as Rhonda mentioned prior, the stretch growth is something we'd like to look further into. Um, that puts them closer to their actual grade level growth. So. All right, so what we're doing, our big plan. We're working as a team, <coughs> for sure. We are a PLC at Kinlock, and every day we were working together. Um, so our ultimate goal for all of our students is reading comprehension. In order to get that, we have to make sure that we are explicitly teaching our word recognition and our language comprehension. So phonics, phonological awareness, which was a huge goal for us last year, and we made great gains, but also making sure we're building background. Uh, we're giving students what they need in you know, oral language as well. Um, I'm going to mention. Question. I, I'm confused about the ESL part. How are those kids? I guess I'm not understanding that part. How are those kids uh, factored into all this? And how are we support, supporting them since we know that they need that extra support? Who's doing that and how is it being done? Are you talking about our I rated data or just in general? In general, everything. So we have our. Students, our EL population is in, our ones and twos are in certain classrooms with certified teachers. Okay. Our EL support well, teacher. Well, I hope all of our teachers are certified, correct? You said what, with What she's teachers. stating is that oh. they're, they have an ESL endorsement. Okay, okay. okay. Sorry. That's why I'm like, okay. <laughs> Sorry, my You're apologies. Okay. You're okay. Um, and then we're looking at the data as well. So our ESL teacher, Sarah Murray at Kinlock, is supporting, on top of that, she is supporting all of her students that have, that are ESL. Okay. So she has her, you know, schedule so that she's supporting those classrooms daily. So she's pushing in also. Also. Okay. In addition to interventionist, classroom teacher support, my support, speech support, special ed support, it's, okay. we're covering it. <laughs> Um, and you bring up a good point. We are making sure we have, we have to fill those gaps. So students who are you know, behind maybe in oral language or you know, any student, we're making sure daily read alouds, our interactive read alouds, where we're explicitly teaching vocabulary, tier one, two, and three, really focusing on that tier two. Um, the oral language sitting in you know, circles daily sentence stems, you know, encouraging students to talk, turn and talk. Um, so there's a ton of that. A um, couple other things I wanted to point, my eyes are bad, oh, sorry. Um, our small group support, we have so many resources. We mentioned the LLI, which is being used daily. We also have Literacy Footprints, which is another small reading group resource. We have our iReady curriculum, which has a beautiful scope and sequence for us. Um, we just, you know, we looked at our data 
for our iReady. We have students who are, you know, in fourth, third and fourth grade that are two or three levels below in phonics that we have a plan. We're supporting them where they're at. Um, we talked about our PLC. We, under the leadership of the amazing Jill Marveso, we have a writing committee going right now. We are aligning our writing curriculum. We are, you know, creating our blue, our blueprints, um, our, you know, our rubrics are being done, um, our non-negotiables, what we expect students to write, you know, in the writing genres daily. Our students have writing binders that follow them from they start collecting pieces in kindergarten, but they follow them all the way through fourth grade. Um, so we're really excited about that. Uh, we are doing a family night for our students. Oh, and our iReady pathway also follows them. I wanted to mention, too, for our students that are at or above grade level, our iReady curriculum, both reading and math, is extremely vigorous. <laughs> it's the depth of knowledge. It's high. Um, so students are getting what they need. The whole class is getting exposure to on-grade level text and above text. So it is so important that all kids are hearing that. And then we're you know, breaking off and giving them support where they need to fill in those gaps, whether it be phonics, whether it be vocabulary, maybe it's fluency, whatever it is, we're supporting them. Coaches, we're really focusing on that tier one instruction. So we're pushing into classrooms. We are modeling, we're co-teaching, we're supporting the teachers however they need. We're covering classrooms so they could go visit other classrooms, which they're doing a lot. <coughs> Um, on the, the quadrant graph that uh, Dr. Basalm had put up, uh, for Kinlock, it showed every grade level to the right, which was great, um, except third grade. Is there a reason why third grade was um, isolated to the left? <laughs> I, I hate to blame it on COVID, but it is, I think, it, it, is, it, it has impacted them. Um, so we know that, and we are doing what we can right now to fill in those gaps to try and okay. catch them up. Okay. I think I think second and third grade, well, which is now third and fourth, is the biggest across the whole county, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, imagine teaching kindergarten online. It's, yeah, and then right. also impacting that is student stamina, you know, and, and being on task. It's really, you know, it shows that they had online education, but we are, we're getting back to it. <laughs> right, no, everyone, everyone, other grade looked great, yep. Okay. My question, <clears throat> did you guys already start the family nights? Oh, you haven't. So have we done them in the past before or no? Oh, we have, yes. So how does it turn out for the family? Oh, um, the last few, well, before COVID and then last year, uh, we had over um, 200 and some people attend the um, Kinlock as well as Highview. I think Highview had one of its biggest years last year. Um, it, so it's done at both schools. This year at Kinlock, we're actually going to do a literacy and math together. Last year, it was just a math night. So a company comes in and actually helps us learn how to do the games. And then when the families come in, we demonstrate the games to the families. And then they each get a coupon to purchase something so that they can take it home with their family also. Um, they seem to really enjoy coming in and doing that. Um, it gets pretty packed. That's so. good. That's great. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and one more question. So, Dr. Masalam, to that note, if there is families that get a coupon, and I don't know what the cost of some of these games are. Is it astronomical, or is it low? Or um, it's anywhere between seven and I think twenty dollars. So, if there is oh, they they buy a lot. <laughs> oh, they buy a lot. Okay, good. They do. But if Every, there is yeah. A, a, yeah. an area yeah. where right. there is a student that really wants it, needs it, and they're not able to you buy will. it, please let Dr. Masala know. Yes, we definitely, definitely will. Definitely, yeah, 100%. Yes. Thank you. Yes, and I don't know if I needed to explain anything. It's pretty much the same for numeracy there. Um, the only thing I did want to kind of piggyback on is what Dina was saying is at both schools pushing in, but specifically um, I've been into a fourth grade room and taught several lessons over the last week. And as a coach, it's helped me to understand somewhat of the frustration teachers may be going through with the new program. And being able to sit back and talk to both principals and say, listen, you know, we want them to be following it with fidelity, but we also need to do the best for the kids. So if it's a five day lesson, you know, sometimes teachers will take it that they need to do it in five days, just because of who we are. 
but have that ability to recognize what your kids need. And so that's another way that teachers and ourselves are looking at things so that it's not for us, it's for the kids to excel, and you have to look outside of that. So um, I just wanted to share that that's going on in I'm sure all of the buildings at this time, um, because it's probably gonna take us a good two to three years to really get the fit of the program, because it is very rigorous, very rigorous. But what's nice is it leads to students having conversation and standing up, instead of the teacher standing up there the whole time, the program des is designed for students to interact with each other and teach each other. And it's, it's, it's a great experience. So, anyway. Thank you. Yep. Thank, Thank you, ladies. Thank you, ladies. Now, as the uh, Riverside team comes up, I want to just emphasize something. You know, we as a district have invested a lot of time and resources and finances into our elementary schools and our early childhood. Why? Because we're not looking at, uh, we're not trying to find a silver bullet. There is not one thing that's going to correct everything, <coughs> but we know that if we give our students what they need in the early grades, it's going to pay dividends down the road. When our middle school and high school talk about things, you have to keep in mind the COVID lag took its biggest hit in middle school and high school. Because when you talk about current ninth graders, they were online and hybrid in sixth and seventh grade. When you talk about current eighth graders, they were online and hybrid in fifth and sixth grade. And if you think about it, that's fundamental, not just academics they lost out on, but also social emotional experiences. And um, so our whole thing was, okay, how do we look at our district and what do we need to do so that we can create this comprehensive plan? So uh, here's our team from Riverside. Hi, um, good evening. I'm Kelly Martin. I'm one of the literacy coaches here at Riverside. Um, what you guys are Jeanette Chris Nagel, also a literacy coach. Christine Adkins, numeracy coach. Hi, everyone. And Rhonda, Rhonda Abdella, and I'm in charge of fifth grade, so I'm K-5. Okay, we get to have her part-time. We like to have her all the time, but we get to have her part-time. Um, so we were pretty excited to have a chance to come and speak with you tonight about what's happening at Riverside because there are some amazing things happening, not just as we, we look at the data and see our growth with the iReady, um, or also the PLC, professional learning communities here at Riverside, um, is stronger and stronger every day. We meet, typically, we meet with our groups of PLCs <coughs> weekly. Um, we meet with them, we talk about our essential standards, we talk about assessments, we're looking at data, identifying things that are working and not working in our program. So that's just a, a bit over overview of what we do to, in a typical day. Um, so our iReady math, we, we want the uh, football theme for our game plan here. So um, our iReady um, reading, we didn't do our, our calculation specifically, but if we're looking at reading, we went from a 27% um, at or above to a 42% at or above with our reading, and we have that 150% um, progress towards annual typical growth. Again, that's what we are expecting them to make. Um, stretch growth was pretty impressive last spring also. We had a celebration for our students who made that above their annual growth. Um, in math, we have, do you want to talk about your math? Do you want me to keep yeah. going? We plan this out of time, can you tell? <laughs> um, for math, we have, uh, we found that the students on or above went from 18 to 36%, which we were happy with. Obviously, we want more, but we're, we're getting there. And then our um, progress towards that typical growth was 110%, which is a really great number. Anything over 100% means that everybody grew on pace. And then we had some kids that grew beyond that pace. Uh, previous coaches talked about that stretch growth that as interventionists, that's really what we're going for. Because that means we're not only keeping them on pace to where they were, but then we're pushing them a little bit further to close those gaps. So. And our interventions. Um, we're not gonna go ahead and read these to you, but the big idea is here. We have um, some consistent things happening across grade levels in language arts. We have a common resource with the iReady Common Core Reading. Um, that is a resource that's going to keep all of us in a similar pace. It's also going to make sure our rigor is returned and stays at a high level for us. Um, fluency routines, um, reading aloud, and um, partner reading with our fifth and sixth grade, seventh grade is also doing it. Um, a lot of the things that we're looking at with all of these initiatives have to do with our workshop model, which was mentioned before, which has to do with a mini lesson, small group instruction, with independence within the small groups, the teacher can then pull students for those tier two interventions and start to fill some of those gaps. So that's a big initiative with our, um, our older grades for sure. 
um, level, level literacy on LICAS we're using, um, formative assessments this year. We have our tutoring program, which is starting next week um, for after school. We also forgot to include our um, literacy and numeracy night, which we're gonna put on our leap day, February 29th this year. So look for that. Um, and I don't know if you guys wanna talk about some of that. Oh, a little bit, yeah. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and connect with the tutoring. Um, so we redesigned the tutoring this year to try to meet the needs of more students, which I'm really excited about. And we're starting tutoring this week instead of February. <laughs> So we're ahead of ourselves already with that, but um, we're gonna be offering it three different sessions. Tuesdays and Thursdays are gonna be after school. On Tuesday, it's going to be um, class rostered, which means we're each teacher's gonna have a roster of eight students and we expect to see them each week on Tuesdays to sort of keep up with them and try to reteach lessons to them and help them with their curriculum so that they can feel a little more successful, like more of a traditional tutoring style. We're also gonna have that same model on Wednesday mornings because we found some kids preferred the mornings, so we have an offering in the morning now on Wednesdays. <coughs> and then on Thursdays, we're gonna do a walk-in tutoring lab. So we're gonna have teachers and NHS kids here, and the kids can come as they need it, when they need it. That way, if we have full rosters, we're not telling anybody that there's no option for them to have tutoring. Last year was all rostered um, for the three days a week and it was all after school. So we're excited about those changes and like I said, we're working on our rosters right now and um, a lot of times those kids are identified through the MTSS process um, as well as teacher recommendations, parent requests. Um, we, try to, we try to target as many of those sort of requests or areas of needs as we can when we're making those lists. So I wanted to um, connect with that. And then um, one of my favorite things about our math this year is that we are gonna have a seventh and eighth grade interventionist back for the math, pro for the math at Riverside. Um, we used to have a seventh and eighth grade interventionist for math and ELA. Um, and after COVID, we sort of just focused on those younger kids that were doing virtual without you know, the, the maturity of an older kid, uh, the ability to sort of follow along on their own, if you will. And so we tried to focus our energy there and Thank you to Yusuf and, sorry, Dr. Masalam okay. and uh, Dr. Lazar. Um, we got to put one of those positions back in, so we're really excited to get her started because that would, that's gonna make a huge difference with her working really intensively on those two tier, interven tier two interventions for those title kids. Beyond that, do you wanna talk about any but of the other stuff? I just know? before you go on, oh, um, yeah. just Steve Fawaz had sure. a question. Just, just a couple questions. Um, would the tutoring work like, um, like they explained for the elementary level, or is it, is it kind of like also games or more like a one-on-one -on -one or? This is um, gonna be more, the rostered list will be more one-on-one -on -one where we're going over your grades, we're going over your assignments, we're going over studying for tests, sort of what you might envision a more traditional tutoring uh, process to be. The kids that are coming in on Thursdays, we're gonna ask them to come in with work. I'm gonna tell you they're, they're not going to, their parents are gonna tell them to come. So that'll be kind of our opportunity to kind of meet that kid where they need to try to entice them, you know, let's practice this, let's work on this, let's have some fun doing this. Miss um, Martin and I are each doing a grade, so we'll be there each of the sessions, and then we have other teachers that are gonna be there, so we'll, able to keep, we'll be able to keep that consistent and make sure that we're reaching those goals that we are set forth with our administration and um, Kelly and I when we met about the tutoring. So it's kind of a, a variety. It's gonna depend on the kid. You know, sometimes they might not have anything to do, at which point we're gonna get in our toolbox and keep them moving. We don't want them to sit idle. Okay. And when you said Wednesday morning, um, are you referring to like before school mm -hmm. or is, okay. Yep, 7.15 to 8 a.m. Okay. I and can then, do it. <laughs> and then the interventionist would work, like Dr. Lazar said, every hour she'd be in a, okay. And is yeah. that referred from the teacher or based off the data? Our intervention groups will all be those bubble kids, those data, uh, we're gonna have spreadsheets for each classroom with those bubble kids identified. So when we go in to do a coaching cycle, we can work with a group of kids during that cycle. Coaching cycle is usually six to eight weeks. So when we walk into that room, we have the teacher goals and what they're wanting to accomplish. And then we also will have a group of kids that we're going to work <coughs> with and track. And then in some classrooms that, you know, maybe there's not an actual coaching cycle in place, but we have an hour in our schedule here or there we would identify a group of bubble kids and go into the room and work with those so that anytime we have an, a in time slot available, we're pulling those bubble kids and helping with the interventionists okay. for those students. So with, with middle school, I know it's a little different because you could actually put you know, some kids um, in an advanced class, right? But you still have the mixture in regular 
is it the same way as um, she said for like it's better to have the mix mm -hmm. in the classroom too for yeah. for that level also yeah ideally okay. a balanced classroom with highs lows and on average students is is obviously the best scenario um, it doesn't always work out that way because other factors play into a role but this is a big reason why we're pushing the math workshop model this year because that way regardless of where a student is academically you can meet them with your differentiated instruction in a small group um, but it takes some time to learn how to manage a classroom in that manner as well as have the kids learn how to be responsible for the time that they're not right in front of their teacher and these are new th theories or formulas on uh, or a different way I guess of showing them how to solve them than in past right not necessarily it's just more of a uh, of leaning away from the traditional model of teaching where a teacher is doing all of the talking because like we all know <laughs> what we're talking about um, we're all aware of the curriculum and the content and you it feels really good as a teacher if you get to the end of the lesson and you're like ah they got it but you did all the talking and it's kind of like the old way of doing things you know you delivered the instruction I mean you all sat in a classroom you know you delivered the instruction the kids had practice and then life went on and now it's more you know this needs to be a student student focused student centered teacher facilitator my model do you want to add that I see you the I ready program is based on a gradual release of responsibility so if something is introduced the teacher is modeling and guiding them then they're you know watching they're giving them the opportunity to practice they usually are practicing together doing small group activity until you know near the end of the lesson that's when they should be able to do it independently so that's what how how this kind of uh, instruction is based yeah does it matter how and I know math is math and in my mind math is math so you either have a right answer wrong answer regardless of how you got to it, but does it matter how they got to it? Like, I still do the little tree for division, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they have to be able to communicate it, right? Right. So, if they say, well, I just did, <laughs> that's, you know, there's no numeracy there. Right. They just did. Okay. We need you to be able to articulate show it. Show your work. Well, and you can show your work. No, 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 you can show your work, but there's still certain, <coughs> and some teachers, I think, require you do it a certain way. You can show your work, still get the same answer, but you didn't do it this way. I think there's some of that, but I'm going to let Rhonda. I'm going to respond to that. So in the middle school, you get your answer, you get your answer. But in the elementary, you are correct. There are, they are assessed on a strategy, a specific strategy. So like you said, like multiplication, we've done it traditionally. In, a, in the elementary, it might be this uh, partial product where you do this box and you put these numbers. And so they're assessed on that. So you are correct that it looks That's a little bit different. Yep. Yeah, I understood okay. your question. But once they get from sixth grade moving forward, math is math, and it's kind of more black or white. As long as they show their work, it doesn't really matter how they got that answer, okay. if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna speak a little bit for fifth grade. I just um, wanted to say, like, our, the fifth grade teachers did a fabulous job last year. Our scores were the highest in the building. Um, I'm super proud of all the work that they've done. That was with piloting, that was with three curriculums. Some had big ideas. We had iReady, we had Reveal, and um, with that, we looked at the data and then pushing and keeping the momentum going to sixth grade with our coaches. And for each one of the teachers that we cycle with, um, they have a goal that they set with us in addition to our bubble kids and everything else that we're doing. It might be classroom management. It might be this lesson is not engaging. It might be something that's measurable, that they have a goal, and then we work together with the teacher and we set the goal from the beginning of the cycle and hopefully get there by the end of the cycle, in addition to the intervention that we're doing with our bubble kids. Okay. I also want to say that our ultimate goal in the end is to have assessments with these students all at a knowledge level of three or four, which means a lot of that, did you show your work in these steps, goes away because it's a much larger scope of a, of a question. When you get to the middle school, your fluency changes from just knowing your facts to perhaps showing all your steps solving an equation. You might say that that's the fluency, is to just be able to show those steps. Then take that to the next step and answer this layered question, whichever route you can get to. There's no prescribed steps to follow. So we're, we're hoping to get there where our DOK levels are threes and fours, and our students are using those critical thinking skills to apply the basic skills. When you hear DOK, what it is, is depth of knowledge, not just knowing the basic, but also analyzing and synthesizing how you got there and why. Okay. Trustee Amy? 
Oh, Trustee Gray. I was just going to say that, you know, how you were talking about the mixing of the students, and that's uh, most likely because of role modeling. Those children are going to role model to, to the other students and lead them into to succeed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Those are the best days when you see kids do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Collaborative Bless learning you. is very important. Some of the best here. Trustee yeah. Amen. Uh, so, so what I'm noticing is in, in all the elementaries, the, the red is a lot lower in both math and English, but when we get to middle school, it's a lot higher mm -hmm. in math and English. Do we need more coach support? Because I, I love the model. I love the, the kids being back involved and the kids speaking. And it's, it's, bringing, it's bringing back, like you said, what the way it used to be back in the day. The kids are going to start working with each other and start learning from each other. But do you think we need more support in the middle school since it's a lot bigger? Because we're talking four or 500 students to now close to 1,200 students. With, with just you four who are doing an amazing job, would, do we need more support for the middle school to bring in more people to help out? Would take anything. I don't, I don't <laughs> <know>. <laughs> Never ask a teacher if they want more. <laughs> no, I think that you're identifying um, a key point. There are days yeah. where we feel we are um, doing amazing at meeting all of our needs, and then there are some days where we're like, I need to clone myself five times yeah. to get where I need to be. But I, what I will say is from, I started this position in a hybrid. Um, it was a little different doing it at that, at that moment. Um, and what I'm seeing from then till now is amazing. Um, I, you know, teachers are looking at data. They're asking questions. They're asking for help. They're signing up for coaching cycles um, with us. They, they are having these discussions that we, we didn't really have. So the, the culture's changing. The mindset is shifting, and that's mm -hmm. what's exciting to me. Do you ever have any during the day workshops? We do, actually that's a good point. So um, we had the opportunity to have our student, our teachers released for the PLC time, and during that time, we worked with them as coaches. They came into our office, we sat down, we looked at essential standards, we looked at assessments. And so while it wasn't a bring from the outside workshop, we brought the information into them. We did some I ready discussions, how do we use the data, what does it look like, um, how can we use the toolbox. So this year our focus is assessments, and we actually have, we're gonna work with a uh, Mr. Casewell, as we've kind of torn some of his uh, staff meeting time away from him a little bit so we can give some more instructional time. So we're trying, again, we're going to have that release time for teachers, but we're hoping to do it in such a way where they have every, every few weeks, they'll have an, at least an hour with us, if not three. So we're going to try and spread it out so all year they will have continual improvement. And for math, we had the teachers come in and do a pre and post test, like a year long test based on our essential standards. <coughs> One that chose the questions, looked at it, and um, last year was our first at the end of the school year, and we do it through MyStar DNA, which means this um, data follows the student. So we just had all our fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade give the pretest, and you know, it, it's kind of, I mean, the students are a little bit like, I don't understand this, but it was a pretest just to see what they know, and then we're gonna give it again in June, and some of the teachers are even using it as their slow, which is their objective, like to show growth from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Slow is a student learning objective. They create them based on their needs. Sorry, I just wanted to confirm the acronyms. I just want to touch base on that real quick question about adding more. It's a longer conversation, but it comes down to how school funding works. Believe it or not, these positions are considered supplemental. They're not considered mandatory. And therefore, we can only use certain funds to pay for these positions, such as Title I, uh, Title II, so on and so forth. And we can't dip into the general budget for these positions because then it becomes a, a supplanting issue. The federal government will come down on us and pull the funding from us. That's where public education funding, we run into all these roadblocks because of the fact that we're only really allowed to use certain funds for certain things, and the minute you cross over, you can no longer use that fund anymore. It becomes supplanting. If, I mean, I will tell you, in a perfect world, and trust me, you know, we're always talking about it in cabinet, we want to add more coaches. We want to add more interventionists. But we always have to wait and see what's the federal government going to give us in terms of our grant funding. So hopefully that answers your question some. <coughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then the last group to present is Crestwood High School. Thank you, everyone.
And the one thing I want to say about all these coaches is these are all highly effective teachers that are coaching and working with other teachers. And the beautiful thing is when you have your own people doing this, it creates the camaraderie and the conversations as was discussed. Like everything you're hearing these coaches talk about to you are the conversations they're having together with teachers and everyone in the buildings. Hi. <laughs> You can pull it out of that if you want. It'll be a lot easier for you. There you go. Thank you. Uh, I'm Julie Jamison. I'm the literacy coach at Crestwood High School. And I'm Shereen Brada. I'm the numeracy coach at Crestwood. Um, so we are focusing on our PSAT data um, since that is something that high schoolers take in 9th, 10th, and 11th grade. Um, the SAT data was already in the uh, presentation previously. So. Um, for our reading data, you can see um, we had a slight decrease from um, uh, 2022 to 2023, but we're still above uh, the state average. Uh, and the same thing um, for the 10th grade, a slight decrease from uh, 2022 to 2023. But again, uh, for the um, PSAT, we're slightly below the state average, um, but we're working towards it. Uh, and then for the math, uh, you could see our PSAT 9, we decreased by a bit and we are a little bit below uh, the state proficiency level there. And then the PSAT 10 uh, was the exact opposite. So we increased by a good chunk there and then we are right above the state proficiency level. And then for our action plan, um, we have, last year we created a ninth grade intervention class for both reading and math. Um, and this year we added a 10th grade intervention class for both reading and math. And uh, Shireen and I hand scheduled students into that class based on their PSAT scores, iReady scores, uh, grades, like previous grades, um, and teacher recommendations. So we have really targeted the bubble kids for those classes. Uh, to make sure that they were placed appropriately just to give them that extra boost. Um, we have seven teachers uh, who have volunteered at the high school to be part of a standards-based grading pilot that we are working with Wayne Risa on. Um, standards-based grading is a more, um, I don't even know, it's a targeted, it, it, it shows what the students know. Um, it, it kind of pairs everything down to did they meet the standard or did they not meet the standard. Um, and it's just a more accu accurate reflection of student learning. Um, and so those seven teachers are um, kind of working it through right now and we're hoping to kind of grow that in a grassroots movement where other teachers kind of hear what's going on in those classrooms and they <coughs> want to join and we'll continue to build that organically. Um, Shereen and I are um, providing those tier one interventions to all of our teachers, not just math and English teachers, but across the curriculum. Um, through our coaching cycles, which I think we'll talk about later. <laughs> um, and we are creating um, data folders, digital data folders for every single teacher uh, with all of their um, scores and everything kind of in one place so that teachers can easily identify who those bubble students are um, in order to give that targeted instruction. And then um, once Shereen and I are in our coaching cycles, which started today, we will also be targeting those students when we push into those classrooms. Um, okay, and then um, we are, our, all of our English teachers are using the six plus one traits of writing rubrics um, in all of their writing assessments. And this year we're really pushing it with the science and the social studies teachers, um, which ties in with the next one, which is our cross-curricular um, slots program in ninth grade. It's basically, um, uh, a shared lesson between English, biology, and U.S. history um, where the students read a variety of texts and then they um, write a CER, which is an argumentative paragraph, um, which the teachers are using the six plus one rubrics to grade, and then there's a CFA based on each text. So that's something we kind of um, work together with the ninth grade PLC and are piloting this year. Um, and then there are also slots for all general math classes that um, really hammer home those SAT practice questions and test taking strategies. And just to touch on that part, um, it's all aligned with our curriculum. So whatever you're teaching, our math teachers are teaching in that class, 
Um, we have warm-up problems where the students can work on those SAT questions that are applying those same concepts. Um, <laughs> the cross-curricular slots are also uh, curriculum-based. Uh, we go back and forth. It's bio one week, U.S. history the other, back and forth like that throughout the semester. <laughs> Uh, in addition, in our math courses, we're also utilizing that flipped classroom approach. So again, that uh, creates more of a student-centered classroom. So students are the ones doing the work and uh, meaning that they are learning. Um, it kind of allows you to do your little mini lesson within 10, 15 minutes, uh, and students are watching that on their own, getting a little bit of foundation so that when they go into classrooms, um, they are, they have that background knowledge to build on and then they have more time for those hands-on activities and cooperative learning groups. Um, we also have instructional rounds across disciplines, so this is where we take um, a good chunk of teachers and we identify a problem of practice uh, and then we would push into classrooms to observe. Teachers would have focus questions, um, so it's just moving Crestwood High School in the right direction. Um, we have 13 teachers from all content areas in the Reader's Apprenticeship cohort. Do you want to add anything about that? <laughs> uh, reading Apprenticeship is an inter interdisciplinary um, approach to reading. So it's taking reading just out of the English class and really hammering home what it means to read in a history class or read in a science class. Um, in our cohort, we have ELL. T we have an ELL teacher, special ed teacher, uh, elective teachers, and then math, science, social studies, and English. Um, so it truly is across the content area, and we're building it every year um, as we go. Uh, and it is. Um, it, it was grant funded through Wayne Risa for many, many years, um, and we're hoping the grant has ended now. But we're hoping to still continue to grow that program. Um, you know throughout the district as well. Uh, we also have our collaborative learning teams that uh, meet on a bi-weekly basis in addition to some extra time. Um, and so those are our PLCs. Um, we have focused on identifying essential standards. We've broken up those essential standards into learning targets. We have worked on uh, creating common formative assessments within those teams so that they can start looking at the data, identify those students that need a little bit more of, uh, a little bit more support, and then planning accordingly. You can kind of share what's working, what's not working with <coughs> your teammates, so it just allows for that uh, conversation as well. Uh, MTSS intervention, so uh, multi-tier system supports, so when students are receiving all their tier one uh, interventions from their teachers and it's still not working. Uh, this is when we bring all the teachers together for a particular student along with Julie and I and we just uh, brainstorm what can we do best to support this student. Um, and then within, we set a goal and then after six to eight weeks we collect data and we meet again and just see what the progress uh, was. If we made any progress, hopefully we did. Um, we are utilizing the co-teaching model uh, with our EL teachers and our special ed teachers, so making sure there's a partnership between the Jenna teacher and any of our uh, EL or special ed teachers that are pushing in to support those students. We worked really hard to uh, get some common planning time in our schedule when it works. Um, grade level coaching cycles, so like Julie had mentioned earlier, we did just start that today so that um, we're doing four weeks at the high school, so it's just where we're working with um, those PLC, those collaborative teams again, and we're identifying those whatever goal that they want to work on, and we're just supporting them in whichever way they f feels best. And then in that, we're also working on those bubble kits, so those partially proficient students. Julie and I would be pulling those and um, supporting them as well. Learning walks, uh, so sometimes we will um, push into other classes, sub for a teacher so that that teacher is able to go and observe a few other colleagues in with uh, specific focus questions. So if there's something that they need to work on or something that they personally just want to work on, um, they're able to see it in practice, um, see what works, see what doesn't work, see what they liked and didn't like, and it just allows for that conversation as well. And then finally, we do have 
an intervention hour for targeted, I can't see, <laughs> tier two students in English. So we, our schedule allowed for that this year. That's it. Any questions Thanks. from the board? So, Can I yeah, please. Go so, ahead. as these ladies wrap it up, um, I just wanted to make a, a closing comment to this team, and I want to thank Mr. Fabris, who's who's back there for being an integral part of um, this team of instructional coaches that we have in the district. Um, they say that. If you're having a bad day, you visit a kindergarten or preschool classroom and they make you smile. If you're having a frustrated day, this is the team to sit with because they will reignite your passion for this profession. Um, I, I am so blessed um, to be able to sit and listen um, to their perspectives of learning pedagogy and and they're always looking for solutions and they're always looking at how to best support the kids and leaving these meetings makes me re-motivated when I go back into the rest of my responsibilities to really want to um, work to continue to move this district forward so I want to thank these ladies for for that um, support that you all provide even to to us Thank, Thank you. you. And just to close out, you know, some you, this <coughs> what you see here with the coaches, Dr. Lazar, Joel, Mrs. Jawad, is that you 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 don't see what happens behind the scenes. It's that's pushing and driving things forward. And before we close out, what I'd like to ask is if all the coaches and their administrators can come, please stand right over there, so that the board and the community can see everybody that's working behind the scenes. Right, right near Trustee Sable. <laughs> I'd like the whole community to see everyone that's working behind the scenes, please. Come on up, don't be shy. And you're gonna get into a photo with uh, Mr. Ray Dune. Come on up. <laughs> right over here. Can you see them over there, David? Come on up, you, got to, you guys got to move in. Joel, Zainab, you need to be there too. And then of course, you know Dr. Lazar, she's right here. The one other thing I, the one other thing, yes, Dr. Lazar, you can join them, please. The one other thing I'd like to say is when you look at our coaches, one last thing, please. When you look at our coaches, I want to say 90, 98% of our coaches are Crestwood employees before this administration. And those that joined us are now true and true <coughs> Crestwood team members. I look goofy sitting down. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Stand with them, Trusty Say, while well, you go. Where's Zainab? Is Zainab in there? Ms. Jawad? Is she hiding? She's hiding in the back. Come on, stand up. We called your name. Mr. Wad, we need you up here, please. She's coming, Rashid. Rashid, don't take it. Just wait. <laughs> and this is, this is the team of people that Dr. Lazar talked about that meet regularly. want to thank all of you for being thank here you. today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And honestly, a special thanks to the administrators for being here. I see all the principals. We have assistant principals here. Thank you to all of you for being here to support your team. Um, with that, Dr. Masalam, we can move into public comments? No, none for study session. No? no. Motion to adjourn, Mr. Chair. Motion moved. We have a... We have a motion by Trustee Sabaugh, supported by Trustee Fawaz, to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes 704. We'll be back 715. Is that too much or 11 minutes? 715, good. 715, okay? Yep. Okay. All right.